Hello, everyone. Welcome to the workshop, Nutrition, What You Eat Does Matter. My name is Marcia, and I will be your moderator for this workshop. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Estellas, whose support helped make this workshop possible. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Ms. Michelle Myers. Ms. Myers is a certified dietitian with a specialty in oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She serves as the primary bone marrow transplant dietitian in the outpatient clinic where she assesses the nutritional needs of oncology patients before, during, and after tra treatment. She also collaborates with the Graft versus Host Disease Clinic on the nutritional issues. In addition to her work at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Ms. Myers is a nutrition consultant for Saver Health Worldwide, where she provides cancer patients with personalized, clinically appropriate nutritional support on demand. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Myers. Hi, thank you all for having me today. So I'm gonna start with going over just some learning objectives for this talk. So first I'm gonna go through the long-term nutritional consequences associated with stem cell transplantation. So that's gonna be gut versus host disease, which I'm gonna to refer to as GVHD going forward metabolic syndrome and osteoporosis. And I'm gonna describe some tips and tricks on how to manage some common side effects that can impact your nutritional status. And finally, I will answer some common myths around cancer and nutrition, and also hopefully help you describe how to evaluate any new nutrition information you may find on the internet. So just a little background, the survival rates of transplant plant patients have increased. So therefore, the long-term and late nutrition effects are of growing importance of things I mentioned, like first graft versus host disease, metabolic syndrome, which can lead to cardio cardiovascular issues, and also osteoporosis. And I'll get into those in more detail in the slides to come. So first, I'm going to talk about chronic graft versus host disease. So chronic graft versus host disease is after it may occur after the first 100 days. It's when it's a problem that occurs when the donor system attacks the patient's organs and the tissues following an allergenic transplant or transplant from another donor. Um, chronic GVHD is more commonly common after the first three months post-transplant, aka 100 days. This condition can affect many body organs, but those most pertinent to nutrition include the mouth, where a patient may develop pain or sores, making it difficult to chew or swallow food. It could also affect the stomach, resulting in decreased appetite, nausea or vomiting, and that feeling of early fullness. And lastly, it can also affect the gastrointestinal tract, where a patient may experience some lower abdominal cramping and or diarrhea. So first off, I'm gonna talk about how chronic TBHD it can actually change your caloric needs, either increasing or decreasing them. You may notice you have increased needs of calories because um, when after transplant, you may have um, damaged body tissue and you need more calories to help regain that weight and strength. But your body may also digest food less efficiently, requiring increased nutrient intake to maintain your weight. Some medications that, such as steroids, steroids may increase your appetite and cause weight gain. So the bottom line is chronic GVHD can cause involuntary weight changes. So first off, I'm gonna get, talk about some ways to help manage involuntary weight loss. The first thing is we wanna focus on higher calorie, higher protein foods. So eating, on a schedule instead of waiting until you feel hungry. So I like to tell patients to schedule eating events almost like you schedule appointments. So you don't have to wait for your stomach to tell your brain, hey, I'm hungry. It can also be very helpful to eat five or six small meeting, mini meals or eating events instead of trying to force yourself to eat three large meals. You can also, um, Get the most bang for your buck every time you're, you eat by choosing foods that are high in calories and protein, such as sauces, gravies, cheese, 
butter, any nut butter like peanut butter or almond butter, cream, olive oil, avocado, honey, and jam. These are good ways to sneak calories in. It's also a good idea to try to incorporate a source of protein at each eating event. Some examples would be chicken, fish, turkey, eggs, nuts, beef, pork, yogurt, cottage cheese, milk, beans, or tofu. A lot of times if you're losing weight and don't have a great appetite, it may be easier to drink your calories in the form of a high calorie smoothie or a shake or an oral nutrition supplement. You may have heard of Boost or Ensure, but there's also a bunch of other products out there. Another way to make a high calorie smoothie or shake is we like to call it MSK, Memorial Sloan Kettering, double milk. You may have heard of this as fortified milk. We could double the calories and protein in our milk by mixing about one quart of whole milk, or if you really do prefer um, low-fat milk, that's fine as well, with one cup of non-fat dry milk powder, and that will now double the calories and protein in your milk. And you can use that milk for the entire week. Next, we're going to talk about involuntary weight gain. So, there's a lot of things we could do for that, but um, first, eating lots of fruits and vegetables. That's because these are high in dietary fiber, but also low in calories. And dietary fiber helps keep you full longer. And other sources of fiber include whole grain cereals and whole wheat pastas. Incorporate lean proteins like fish, and chicken without the skin. Aim to choose low-fat or non-fat dairy products versus the full-fat or whole-fat, whole like I mentioned in the previous slide, if you're noticing involuntary weight loss. It can also be helpful to keep a food journal. This can help you track what you eat, when you eat, and monitor your portion sizes. And it also can help you just be a mindful eater in general. It may make you stop and think, do I want that second cookie if you have to write it down? And lastly, increasing your physical, daily physical activity. And that can actually be helpful for involuntary weight loss as well because physical activity can improve your energy and your appetite, but also burn some calories. So next I'm gonna go through the common side effects of chronic GVHD and how to manage them. So. This is when we become a little bit more concerned at, for risk of developing malnutrition or malnutrition in general. It's when we have chronic issues such as the ones listed here, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, or anything that's going to affect the appetite, digestion, or absorption of nutrients, and we're causing us to lose weight unintentionally. So that's when you know here, I like to be really proactive or even reactive in some cases. So I'm going to, in my next slides, I'm going to go through some of these common symptoms and give you some tips and tricks on how to manage them. So first off, I'm going to talk about managing nausea. So it can be really helpful to eat six to eight small meals per day instead of three large meals. Try not to skip meals because an empty stomach can actually exacerbate nausea, making it worse. You may notice um, blander foods may be tolerated better versus, you know, really fatty, greasy, or spicy foods. Ginger candies, like sucking on any ginger candies or incorporating any ginger tea can decrease nausea. Additionally, eating dry foods like crackers, toast, dry cereal, breadsticks, or pretzels can be a good option, um, especially even putting them by your bedside. So when you wake up, you can have them or have them every few hours to settle your stomach. Additionally, if smells bother you, Try eating foods that are cold or at room temperature, or even avoid the kitchen during meal prep if you have someone preparing food for you so you don't get any um, aversions to that smell. Um, it could be helpful additionally to eat in a cool, well-ventilated room that, don't, that doesn't have any strong smells. Cover an open cup with a lid and drink through a straw. And again, like I said, remember meals as an empty stomach can make nausea worse. So this is a kind of quick overview of how we can manage diarrhea. We want to avoid foods or drinks or beverages that can make diarrhea worse. So some of these foods include foods high in fiber, 
such as whole wheat breads and whole wheat pasta, drinks that have a lot of sugar, such as regular soda or fruit punch, very hot or very cold drinks, greasy, fatty, or fried foods like French fries or hamburgers, or foods or food and drinks that can cause gas, like dried beans, raw fruits, and vegetables. Also, sometimes people have an intolerance to milk products unless they are low lactose or lactose free. And additionally, some um, foods with caffeine may make diarrhea worse, like regular coffee or tea or soda or chocolate. Lastly, sugar-free products, so anything steamed with sorbitol or xylitol, may make may exacerbate diarrhea. But it's very important to drink plenty of fluids to replace those you lose from diarrhea and prevent dehydration. A nice rule of thumb is for each loose stool you have, try repleting it with one cup of fluid. So that could be, you know, water, but also you could choose foods and liquids with sodium and potassium because those are the electrolytes we lose when we have diarrhea. So, for example, we could do a sports drink, but also even broth for sodium or bananas and potatoes for potassium. We could eating several small meals throughout the day, which I think you'd see is a common theme in a lot of these side effects. Additionally, lying down for 30 minutes after a meal may help slow your digestion, but to really personalize this further for you, I recommend working with a dietitian because it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Next is managing dry mouth. If you notice your mouth is dry, you're probably going to tolerate soft, blander foods that are cold or at room temperature. Um, you can moisten foods in broth, soups, sauces, gravies, oils, and butter. You can also use these foods as dips. To increase saliva production, try tart foods and, and drinks such as lemonade, even lemon sorbet, or cranberry juice. It would be helpful to suck on you know, sugar-free candies or even chew some sugar-free gum to stimulate saliva production. I've noticed that citrus-flavored candies may work best. And practicing proper oral hygiene is super important. Do a mouth, make a mouth rinse with one quart of water mixed with about three quarters of a teaspoon of salt and one teaspoon of baking soda and just swish and spit. And you can do this frequently throughout the day. So very similar to what I spoke about with involuntary weight loss, but if you just have an overall lack of appetite, eating those six to eight small meals a day, eating on the clock, get the most bang for your buck with high calorie, high protein foods, always bring something with you as well. Also drink, you could drink high calorie beverages in between meals and also drink more of your fluid in between meal time, especially if you notice you're getting full quickly. It could be really helpful to separate eating and drinking. And lastly, getting any physical activity because this can help improve your appetite. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some other their long-term consequences of after transplant. And the next first would be managing metabolic syndrome. So first, I'm going to describe what that is. There's First, there's a pretty high incidence after the first year and five years after transplant. It's characterized by at least three of the five characteristics I have listed here below. You could see um, uh, an apple versus pear distribution for centralized obesity. We ideally want to see that pear body shape. High levels of that in the blood, that LDL or bad cholesterol or triglycerides, low levels of good cholesterol, and I'm going to get into cholesterol a little more in the next slide, um, high blood pressure and high fasting blood sugar. But I want to say there's some good news. We can be really proactive with our nutrition here by maintaining a healthy weight, um, keeping in, more, in mind those portion sizes and meal planning. Portion control is an easy way to th think about this. You know, making half your plate vegetables, a quarter lean protein, and a quarter whole grain. Meal planning also works. It does take time, but studies show that planning your meals will help make you healthier. So let's get it back into go switch gears a little bit and go back into cholesterol. So looking first 
at cholesterol. Really, what is it? We've heard a lot about this in recent years. It's a type of lipid, or we could call it blood fat, in our bodies that form cells, make hormones, and produce vitamin D. Our bodies make both good HDL, cholesterol, and bad cholesterol, LDL, but persistently high levels of cholesterol, as well as other, another blood fat, fat called triglycerides, are associated with metabolic syndrome and do place a person at risk for cardiovascular or heart disease. And if you look at that diagram there on the right, you'll see that normally without any kind of cardiovascular disease, our blood flows through our body very easily. But with time and buildup of cholesterol and other fats, the vessels there become narrowed. And with many years or a prolonged period of time, you could see that the actual vessels become occluded so that blood flow cannot that blood cannot flow through and may set a person up for cardiac events. So we want to prevent that. So then this slide will just list what our normal blood fat or cholesterol and triglyceride levels are. This is all data from the American Heart Association. So cholesterol ide levels ideally should be below 200. And then you ha have the values there for both the good and the bad cholesterol. And the triglyceride levels, again, another blood fat, should be below 150. So if you're not sure what your cholesterol or your blood fat lipids are, you may want to think about asking your health care provider to check these levels. And we recommend that you get fasting levels. Um, in other words, going an eight hour or a period without having anything to eat or drink prior to getting these, your blood drawn, because this will give a more accurate result back and can then track it and see if there's any kind of intervention that needs to be done. Because again, this is treatable. So what can we do if we have high cholesterol, high triglyceride levels? What kind of dietary measures can you take to help lower these levels? So I'm going to talk about dietary fats. There are different types of fats found in our common food supply. There's a group called unsaturated fats, and these are plant-based foods. We know that these types of foods help to lower the LDL or bad cholesterol. Common foods include some listed here, like avocado, canola, oil, olive oil, both the fruit and the oils, sesame or sunflower, whole grain bread, nuts, and the whole grain cereals. Again, all of these more plant-based foods that can help lower the bad cholesterol. Omega-3 fats can help lower your triglycerides. Omega-3 is another type of good fat or healthy fat that's found in plant-based foods and fish. These help to lower the triglyceride levels. Things like salmon, sardines, tuna, dark green leafy veggies, such as kale or spinach, legumes made up of lentils or other dried beans, walnuts or flaxseed oils, or even omega-3 rich eggs. Omega-3 eggs are actually developed when hens are given flaxseed. So fun fact, oil is part of their diet. So again, more plant-based foods to help lower the triglyceride level. So those, these are all the good things we can incorporate in our diet to help lower cholesterol. And saturated fats. These fats, however, um, are the ones we want to watch out for. These are the saturated fats and trans fats, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Saturated fats come primarily from animal sources. These can actually increase the LDL, or again, that bad cholesterol level, more so than anything like dietary cholesterol. Saturated fat it will increase your blood cholesterol. So things like processed meat, bacon, sausage, red meat, beef, lamb, and pork, full fat dairy. But again, if you are noticing that involuntary weight loss, I do recommend incorporating the full fat dairy. But cream, butter, cheese, palm oil, lard, and chocolate. And then real processed food in general. And then last type of fat I'm going to talk about is the trans fats. Um, these are the really artificial fats. Basically, you take a liquid fat, you pump it with hydrogen molecules to make it more solid. 
these types of fats can actually increase the bad cholesterol, but also decrease the good cholesterol. They're primarily found in processed foods, things like margarine and shortening, many fried foods, and some crackers and chi chips also contain trans fats, less and less as um, food manufacturers are, are changing how they're preparing things. So again, these are the fats that we want to try to limit in our diet and focus more on plant-based fats. So omega-3 fatty acids, and those unsaturated fats, like the polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats. So next I'm gonna talk about, we just spoke about metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease. So I'm gonna move on with another complication that we frequently see post-transplant, and that's osteoporosis. So what is that? By definition, osteo means bones and porosis means full, full of holes. So osteoporosis is a condition where the bones are full of holes. So the density or the thickness has decreased. You can see in this picture there, if you look at the vertebra or, and the femur bones, the normal on the left and someone with osteoporotic bones on the right, you can see the vertebrae are starting to tilt a bit. They become soft, more of the hunched over appearance, and again, changes in our bone density. So, why are transplant patients at risk of developing osteoporosis? Well, it's a really common side effect, about 50 to 60% um, incidence. Some of the primary causes and risk factors include the patient has any kind of pre-existing disease going into transplant. Hormonal ch changes also certainly play a role. And we know that patients maintained on long-term ster steroid therapy specifically one called prednisone, may be at a higher risk of developing osteoporosis. We also know that patients with a sedentary lifestyle are more at risk. Finally, with osteoporosis, this can cause long-term issues such as fractures, disability, or loss of independence. So this can be a major complication post-transplant, but again, lucky enough, there are some things we could do to intervene. So we, the best thing we could do is meaning, maintaining good bone health after transplant because osteoporosis can be reversible. So we want to aim to get adequate calcium and vitamin D to protect your bone health. And I'm going to go through specific food sources on the next slide. Um, you also may want to check with your healthcare provider if you need a calcium or vitamin D supplement as osteoporosis is very common, especially after the first year. Now, sometimes during the transplant process, we become very sensitive to dairy and may become lactose intolerant, and that's okay. So I'm going to again go through other food sources on the next slide. Um, incorporate weight-bearing exercise to help with your bone health. What is that? Weight-bearing exercise means you're carrying extra weight. So this is using free weights or using a strength training machine. What this does is it puts more weight on your bones, so it's helping to make those bones stronger. And additionally, um, medication, there can be medications prescribed to you to slow bone loss as well. So here's just an example slide of some sources of calcium and how much calcium is in each of these foods. So we remember that 1,500 milligrams of calcium is the recommended dose. So if we look at this a bit further, how do you know how much calcium is in a particular food? Well, here I just totally, I listed it for you, but on a food label, it lists calcium at the bottom. And that's all for a specific serving size. So for example, we have here one cup of low fat milk has about 305 milligrams of calcium per serving. And per serving is one cup. But if we had two cups, we'd get double that. There are some other sources like almonds, sardines, figs, soy milk. Additionally, we will see a lot of foods um, fortified with calcium or vitamin D. So if you're lactose intolerant, don't worry. Many breakfast foods are calcium fortified. So that could be a great source as well. And it'll say it right on the, the food label. And to finish up, I know we've gone through that pretty quickly. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to We'll do some myths 
is, are they healthy or harmful? But I'm going to start by how to, teaching you a little bit how to evaluate nutrition information since there's so much crazy, so much information out there from social media, the internet, Dr. Google, friends, family, you want to evaluate it critically. So can, I find that cancer survivors as a group are really highly motivated to learn about health issues and make positive lifestyle changes. But survivor research is in its early stages and um, dependable science-based recommendations can be really difficult to find. Meanwhile, uninformed or even, you know, people trying to make a dollar or two sometimes rush to fill the information gap with inaccurate or misleading advice. Media reports can overstate the results of research. Makers of products may tout unverified health claims, and the Internet enables baseless rumors about diet and cancer to reach people worldwide. So some tips to evaluate what's reliable when it comes to health claims. So I say first, read information closely. Science progresses slowly and carefully, so be wary of products described with words such as breakthrough, miracle, or even discovery. Another red flag is a product whose claims rely on anecdotal evidence, which I mean by that is testimonials or case histories rather than published data based on research with many patients. Next, make sure to get the whole story. Television, radio reports about science, or podcasts even about science can be short and lacking in detail. Look for more complete information in magazines and newspapers. Always think, who conducted and paid for the study? Was it published by a trusted source? Is there a consensus from research in the field to round up information from a single study? These are all questions you can ask in your head. Maintain that healthy skepticism and particular wariness of easy answers. I believe, you know, human nature has us looking for quick fixes to solve health problems. But cancer is a complex disease. The human body, an intricate machine, and the foods we eat contain a vast number of health-promoting components. The most helpful strategy will address the overall diet, not single foods or supplements. Lastly, turn to your doctor or other health care provider or dietitian for advice you can rely on. Um, always talk to your health care professional before trying any new strategy. And they can um, share the benefit of their extensive training, experience, and knowledge of meaningful developments in the cancer field. Inform, inform them about all the medications and supplements you're taking. There are certain herbal supplements for example, that may interact with cancer medication, making treatment less effective. So always talk to your doctor about anything else you are doing. Now I'm gonna go through some common myths versus facts and explain them a little, in a little more detail. So has everyone read that sugar feeds cancer? I'd assume yes, but hopefully I can bust this myth for you. Because the belief that sugar in the diet somehow preferentially feeds cancer is a very common belief among patients. But that truth is a lot more complicated. All cells, including cancer cells in our body, use sugar in the form of glucose from our bloodstream for fuel. We get that blood sugar from foods we eat that contain carbohydrate, carbohydrate including healthful vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and low-fat dairy sources. Some glucose is even produced within our bodies from protein. The connection between sugar and cancer is very indirect. Eating a, people who eat a lot of high sugar foods or added sugar foods like cookies, candies, and cakes may be getting more calories than they need in their diet. Having an overeating in general can lead to excess weight and body fat. It is really that excess body fat that has been convincingly linked to a greater risk of certain cancers. Because being overweight or obese can put your body in that state of inflammation, which can lead to DNA damage and thus certain cancers. So bottom line, sugar doesn't feed, doesn't necessarily feed cancer and that it's a very indirect relationship. Eating a lot of hot, high sugar foods, like I said, it should be an arrow, not a little question mark there, leads to excess calories in your diet, which leads to excess weight, 
and body fat, which is all linked to chronic disease. So focus on having a balanced, healthy diet. Choose those healthy carbohydrates like whole grains and natural fruit. If you want to indulge in cookies, candies, cake, indulge mindfully and have a small portion. And again, think of choosing foods that provide nutritional benefits like the whole grains that are high in fiber and fruits that have high antioxidant benefits, anti-inflammatory benefits, the list can go on and on. Next, I'm gonna talk about a ketogenic diet. So what is it exactly? It is a very high fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate diet. Don't mistake this for a high protein diet. So keto means ketone, genic means producing. So ketogenic means producing ketones in the body. Um, what does this mean exactly? The theory behind this, this in general for cancer patient is, patients is that if we thought sugar feeds cancer by not having any carbohydrates, we could starve the tumor of glucose. But this isn't really the whole picture because again, the relationship between sugar and cancer is more about obesity rather than sugar as a fuel for cancer. So ketones, for a ketogenic diet, if you're having very small amounts of carbohydrate, ketones are formed when the body uses fat for its source of energy. Normally, the body uses carbohydrates like sugar, bread, pasta, et cetera, for fuel. But because the ketogenic diet is very, very low in, in carbohydrate fat, it becomes the primary fuel instead. So just to put this in perspective, this is through truly following that ketogenic diet, carbohydrates would be about 5% of your total intake um, based on a 2,000 calorie a day diet. So that means you would get 25 grams of carbohydrate per day maximum to stay in ketosis. But one medium apple contains about 25 grams of carbohydrate. Anything more than that, and you're out of ketosis. This is a very hard, restrictive diet to follow. So the ketogenic diet has been an acceptable medical option for treating um, epilepsy and is being studied for people with brain cancer right now. The use of the ketogenic diet during any treatment for different types of cancer may also, is also being studied, but there's certainly no recommendation for cancer patients or survivors to follow this very restrictive diet. Um, it also, has a lot of side effects have been reported, like constipation, anemia, some cardiac, abnormalities as well as dehydration also promotes really bad breath um, but the bottom line you know currently there's no recommendation or research to promote it so a pretty hot topic is gluten and do you need to follow a gluten-free diet so what is a gluten-free diet it excludes any food that have gluten in it. So only whole foods that don't contain gluten, such as fruits, vegetables, meat, and eggs, as well as processed gluten-free foods like gluten-free bread or pasta. Gluten is a protein naturally occurring in certain foods, but it can also be added to foods during processing for texture. Gluten can be used as a binding agent and flavoring, so you can sometimes find it in foods you wouldn't necessarily expect. In addition to foods like pizza, pasta, cereal, those baked goods, um, it can also be found in things like beauty products and dietary supplements. Some people think going gluten-free means not eating any carbohydrates. That's not the case. Lots of foods contain carbs, such as rice, potatoes, beans, um, and don't contain gluten. So a gluten-free diet is necessary for people with celiac disease, which is an autoimmune response to gluten that causes the body to attack the small intestine, which causes belly pain, nausea, bloating, or diarrhea, or sometimes less commonly symptom-free, but it will still cause damage to the lining of the small intestine. People with celiac disease can't tolerate gluten in any form, and 
you need to follow a strict gluten-free diet for the rest of their lives. Their lives. If you cut out all gluten from your diet and you don't have celiac disease, there's a risk that you can miss out on a lot of nutritious foods like whole grains, fiber, and macronutrients, micronutrients. So the bottom line, unless you have celiac disease or experience discomfort with eating gluten, no need to avoid because some people are gluten sensitive, but don't have celiac disease. So if you notice you know, any of those um, any gluten products causing you discomfort, perhaps try keeping a food symptom journal to see if it's something you do need to avoid. But overall, no need to follow it, no health benefits unless you have celiac disease. So the next myth is our substitutes or supplements a substitute for nutrients in food. The short answer is no, no, no. Um, I wanna read the quote that came out from the American Cancer Society that I want to repeat to you. I thought it was really good. Um, dietary ingredients and supplements don't offer the same benefits as eating whole foods. Research has shown that supplements do not offer cancer protection or provide benefits to survivors worried about reoccurrence. Supplements also may not be well absorbed by the body and in high doses may be potentially harmful. Some supplements have been shown to interfere with medication. And be wary of all the claims about supplements. I know they may, some may say you can get all your fruit, your vegetables in this one pill. Be careful of these because they're all, these statements are also not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. So do you need to eat all organic foods? So, all right, is organic food healthier? Um, well, what is organic food to begin with? They're plant foods grown without pesticides or weed killers. But is it healthier? Not, necessar not necessarily. Studies have found, I should say, should not found, I should say any clinically significant differences between organic foods when it compares to conventional foods. But this is a personal decision, but it should be an informed decision. Organic food does not mean healthier. Um, you remember, you could still buy organic cookies, chips, and other snacks, and they can contain the same number of calories, fast, the bad fats, like that saturated fat and sugar as conventional brands. So bottom line, you could still get a very nutrient-rich diet from a non-organic diet. So this comes down to real personal preference. And I'm gonna end with, with my, leave my last slide, so I'm gonna end with one last myth. Do you need to follow a vegetarian diet? Well, a vegetarian diet may be healthier, a healthier alternative to that typical Western diet with you know, all the fried food, um, red meat, but there is no clear evidence that a vegetarian diet is more protective against cancer than a mostly plant-based diet, meaning containing small amounts of meat and dairy foods. If you do follow a vegetarian diet, you should make sure you're including many different vegetables and fruits, but also protein alternatives to meat, such as beans, eggs, tofu, fish, or small amounts of low-fat cheeses. And I believe that's it. And I would like to thank you for letting me come talk today. And I believe we are gonna open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Myers, for this wonderful presentation. We will now begin the question and answer session. The first person would like to know if yeast and honey are okay to eat when you are on immunosuppression meds. So it's um, honey. I would be careful of having raw, unpasteurized honey, but I think any honey found in the grocery store should be just fine. And in terms of nutritional yeast, um, Again, I would look at, you know, the food label, but you should be okay with it. Um, we really cut back on having a real restrictive diet. We like to just focus on basic, basic food safety guidelines. I make chicken broth or bone broth every week. Should I worry about my kidney function, and can bone broth help bone function? 
So in ter- if you should be worried about your kidney function, I would, um, it would all depend on your personal situation, but broth is great. Bone broth is not necessar- doesn't necessarily mean it can promote healthy bones, but it does have more protein than regular broth. So it could be a good option, but again, it's, I love the idea of you know, making it yourself, but the true benefits are unclear. Do you find black or green teas benefit blood pressure or other health parameters? If so, what quantity? I First, I would say if you want to incorporate tea, that's great. Um, I think green tea might have a little bit more health benefits um, in general, but go with your personal preference. I wouldn't force yourself to drink um, any certain amount because the research would, is, would be unclear and I'd be making up the amount if I were to say you have to drink three cups of green tea or one cup of green tea. I hope that helps. Thank you for that. The next question I ask, is it okay to take a small dose of vitamin K2? I have read that it helps direct calcium to the bones where it should go. I would definitely talk to your um, medical team about any supplements, like I mentioned. Is GVHD an inflammatory response? If so, is eating a gluten-free diet beneficial to reduce inflammation? Or are these two types of inflammation unrelated? I ask because I have been gluten-free since my transplant two years ago. Can I stop my gluten-free diet? Or is being gluten-free beneficial for transplant recipients? You can assume I am not gluten intolerant. Well, I think I did pretty much answer that for you. If you do not have that intolerance to gluten, there is no need for you to avoid it. Well, you know, Chronic GVHD does put your body in that state of inflammation. Gluten is not putting your body in that state of inflammation. So I definitely think you should start liberalizing your diet and incorporating gluten. I am 71. How do I reconcile increased calcium intake for my bones with the risk of heart disease? Well, you can increase your calcium without your increasing your risk of heart disease by incorporating. There's a lot of great um, food sources of calcium that are not that are heart healthy, like any calcium fortified cereals. We could do low fat or non fat dairy products, and also your medical team may advise you to take a calcium and vitamin D supplement. Any tips on how to get vitamin C if I am avoiding citrus because of significant acid reflux? Yeah, so vitamin C is also found in a lot of green leafy vegetables as well. Should I be juicing instead of a meal? Can I eat greens and green tea in treatment? I would prefer you eating the food instead of juicing it. And remind me of the second part of that question. They want to know. They want to know if they can eat greens and green tea. Oh, so yeah, greens definitely just make during treatment. Make sure um, you're just washing every all your produce really well. And green tea should not be a problem unless you were told otherwise. Someone would like some suggestions on what to eat while they have GVHD in the mouth. So that's a great question. Question. Um, I suggest softer, more moist foods or some good smoothies or shakes that we can make that are high calorie or high protein. For example, we could put in the blender, um, some yogurt, um, even avocado, peanut butter, banana, blend that up and even add in some protein powder and that may be a lot easier to tolerate. And um, actually cope, not exacerbate any pain in your mouth. How much protein can an athlete consume after an allogeneic transplant, trying to build back strength and lost muscle post currently two, uh, 22 years post-transplant? So first of all, you need enough calories for your, if you have only enough, a lot of protein but not enough calories, that protein won't be spared for your muscles. So first you want to make sure you're getting enough calories. And I would just 
instead of counting in grams, which you definitely can do, I'll just try to focus on having a source of protein at all meals and snacks and, and doing that physical exercise. But rule of thumb is, we, I'd say, you know, if you don't have kidney, any kidney issues, if you want to take your weight in kilograms, which is pounds divided by 2.2, and then multiply that by 1.5. That could be your target grams of protein. How can I regain a good, good gut microbiome without just eating yogurt every day? Well, that gut microbiome is a very hot topic. Um, having a healthy gut microbiome, Biome is actually, can actually be done by having a wide variety of um, high fiber foods. So I like to say eat the rainbow. So a wide variety of fruits and vegetables because each fruit and vegetable or each color has different health benefits, but also high fiber foods, um, the way they're digested, um, they promote good gut bacteria. And they're food for your bacteria in your gut. So you don't have to focus only on yogurt. I usually feel tired after lunch and dinner. So lying down right after meals, is it good or bad for the health? So lying down after eating, if you have anything like reflux, is probably not a good idea. You'd want to be staying upright. But if you feel a need to lie down, definitely do so. Um, I'm not, it, I don't think it's going to be detrimental to your health unless you have experiencing reflux. You may want to try just eating smaller, more frequent meals throughout the day. If you're getting really tired, that may make eating a lot easier. I've been told that a cancer patient should follow a Mediterranean diet. Is this true? I, but there's some great research that talks about the benefits of a Mediterranean diet, and it's really just a general balanced, healthy diet. So, yeah, I, there's no harm in it. Um, it really focuses on those healthy fats like I spoke about. It doesn't have a lot of red meat in the diet. So I recommend limiting red meat, which is considered beef, lamb, and pork, to less than about 12 ounces a week, which is about three portions a week. If the, each portion is about the size of your palm or a deck of cards. So the Mediterranean diet incorporates a lot of good healthy fats and fruits and vegetables, which I love. Okay, someone would like to know, um, wonder if you know why someone would suddenly change from having minimal appetite to having a huge appetite with no change in meds or exercise. So the exact reason why, I don't necessarily know, but oftentimes I just see all of a sudden patients turn a corner completely and, you know, all their appetite's back. They no longer have any difficulty um if they're having any taste changes, and but things happening all of a sudden, I would always ask your doctor for any reason, real, real reason why. Okay, someone would like to know what are the best antioxidants for them to eat? So remember when I mentioned um, talking about evaluating nutrition information? No one specific food is good or bad. Uh, is the best, I mean. So having a wide variety. So again, you know, these plant-based foods. And a great resource I love is American Institute of Cancer Research. On their website, they have a whole list of foods that fight cancer and explains their health benefits. For example, blueberries are very high in antioxidants. But again, eating that rainbow gives you the, all the antioxidants. Do you recommend probiotic? Um, I would talk to your medical team about taking any probiotics. Okay. Do you have any data on post-metabolic syndrome issues with CAR-T therapy compared to stem cell transplant? I know CAR-T cell therapy is so new. Um, so on the top of my head, I do not. Okay. What is your That's opinion about... Question. Okay. What is your opinion about nutrients of supplementation with these high vitamin C infusion that some of these places sell as a way to deal with cancer? <sighs> and this got me very upset. Um, I very I work at a institution that's all evidence based, so 
I am very against that. Do you know why some people develop coatings in their mouth? I, I, why? I don't know. But if you notice, you have that white coat, um, coating on your tongue. Something that I found that could be really helpful is if you just put a little fresh pineapple on your tongue, that could really help with the enzyme in that pineapple. That's helpful. Why do some people become lactose intolerant after transplant? There are many reasons uh, why, but if you notice you become lactose intolerant, it's, you're, it's a good time of, in the world to be lactose intolerant because there are so many products out there that are dairy-free. And it's, I think the flavors of Ben & Jerry ice cream in the dairy-free options are better than the regular. I know it is not safe ever for us to eat hamburger rare, but if you are several, several years post-transplant, is it safe to eat steak or roast beef rare? I would say most likely not fully rare, maybe just because it's never really great to eat fully rare meat. But as long as your counts are fine, you should be fine. But for most people, I want you to stick to stick cooking food to that safe minimum internal temperature. The next question asks, a few years ago, I was advised to avoid pre- and probiotics as research was still being done, whether these were helpful or harmful post-transplant. Do you know if they are recommended these days or not? Right. During the transplant process, they are not routinely recommended. I have a great deal of and cannot tolerate most foods. I have tried taking Zoltran and other meds, but they don't seem to help. I also find that I cannot tolerate eating foods when they are hot or warm. They must be room temperature or cold. Also, finding I cannot tolerate most proteins except seafood or a very limited amount of chicken. What do you recommend? Well, first off, I'm sorry you are dealing with that. There are other anti-nausea medications out there, so it always talk to your team. There's another one called Reglan, but also trying. I really like the website um, cookforyourlife.org, and you can filter out for recipes by symptoms, so you can look for nausea recipes. So they may have a lot of you know good smoothies or shakes, and if you're having trouble with you know protein, maybe think of you know, unconventional sources of protein that aren't your meat, your chicken, or your fish. For example, um, maybe some beans or lentils or even some nuts or seeds can be a good source of protein. Okay, we are running out of time, so this is going to be our last question. Uh, someone would like to thank you for your presentation and would like to know about prednisone for chronic GVHD. They said they're HBG A1C has increased into pre-diabetic range. How can I find a dietitian to help me create a plan to help address weight gain? And are there any meal planning books or resources that you would recommend? So there's a lot. um, Yeah, so prednisone does increase our blood sugar, unfortunately. Um, I would say to find a dietitian, you can... First, of course, ask your um, healthcare provider, but also the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has a, their website, and you can search for find a provider, and you can even look for um, one that may take your insurance. Or even if you're working with an endocrinologist, a lot of times an endocrinologist may have a dietitian on staff as well. On behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, I'd like to thank Ms. Myers for a very helpful presentation and thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. Please contact BMT InfoNet if we can help you in any way. Enjoy the rest of this symposium.